It's time. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Raul Burial from Oregon State University. Um, actually, I recognize a number of you, so hi. And uh, to all the newcomers, hi. Uh, and uh, I'm doing two presentations back to back. And they're uh, both uh, generally under the umbrella of the media, media ecosystem in higher education. Uh, and I'll explain uh, what I mean by that. Uh, this first one relates to capture, specifically lecture capture, and comes from a report which I suspect many of you have seen that we wrote last year. We call it a white paper. I don't know if there's a specific definition as to what a white paper is, uh, uh, where we evaluated a number of lecture capture appliances, and uh, then we published it. And uh, then we terrified a lot of lecture capture manufacturers. Um, and uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'll go through a few definitions. Oh, you all want to get your laptops and tablets and stuff out. There will be a poll, uh, which I just threw together for the first time this morning. So this is exactly the right time to test it. Um, so that's me. Uh, and if you need to contact me anytime, I take phone calls from everyone and anyone all the time. Feel free to call me up anytime and ask me any questions you want. I, I love to talk, and that's why I'm talking for two hours today. Um, ecosystem, uh, media ecosystem encompasses all aspects of media workflow from creation to storage and delivery. Uh, in higher education, we're talking about the creation of audio and video files, sometimes photos, although photos oftentimes are an entirely separate silo, uh, where they're uploaded and where they appear, through, be it on a public-facing portal or in a digital asset management system or through your learning management system. Uh, basically, you've got your create, store, deliver. Oops, clicked. Um, this is a graphic I love to pull up. Uh, Frost, uh, Frost and Sullivan uh, put this out in a report they made in 2012, which terrifies everyone. This is a media ecosystem. Uh, truth is, your university has one of these. Uh, what fills each one of those spaces varies. And in a number of cases, uh, the answer is probably YouTube. YouTube, 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 YouTube. Uh, which is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, this is something I drew, which is similar to the Frost and Sullivan uh, thing. Uh, I just pulled up some uh, flow chart. And, but again, it's, it's no cleaner. It's chaos. Truth is, media ecosystems are messy. Uh, we are going to be talking right now about lecture capture, which is just that little teeny tiny one right up there in the corner. Uh, and in my, it's this corner over here, it's capture. It's the creation of the content. And so what do we mean by capture? Uh, in context of higher education, capture means lots of things. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the uh, recording of lectures and course materials. Uh, so. Uh, an important thing that you, you need to understand is like don't let the technology or the venue dictate the content. Um, what that means is basically just because uh, all I have in this room is X, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that I can't do Y. Uh, you, uh, well, it may mean you may have to uh, relocate, but more likely you, simp you simply need to find a way to adapt. Uh, faculty are going to use whatever venue they have. You can always recommend but uh, they don't always follow your recommendations and you're just going to have to find a way to adapt. Uh, captures can be made in the home or office in a classroom space or dedicating recording spaces, studios. Uh, and captures can employ a variety of different technologies. And this is where we're going to do a poll. It's a long URL, I'm sorry. Uh, pollev.com and then R-A-U-L-B-U-R-R-I-E-L-116 or with your phone you can text that number, let's see if this works. The question is, uh, how are lecture recordings being done into your institution? And I, if I've set this up right, you should be able to answer, uh, give more than one answer, because no institution is only recording in one way. So let's see if this works. And if it doesn't work, then we're just gonna skip the polls from here on in. Let's see if I have to do something else. Come over here. Oh, there's one. Let's go to full screen. Should do a little word cloud. TechSmith, anybody else? Maybe this isn't working. How about y'all shout out your answers? TechSmith. TechSmith. It's only TechSmith. <laughs> Nobody else is using anything else. Mom? 
your mom. Camcorders, yes, in studio spaces certainly, and in classroom spaces as well. Hangouts. Ooh, look at all those answers coming in. Echo 360, Google, PTZ cameras, um, VC, video conferencing. We use video conferencing for a long time as a recording solution. Uh, button, I'm guessing that's like a one button solution. VHS, no. Who's still doing VHS? WebEx, yes, we suffer WebEx as well. Uh, oh, media site, of course. Um, let's see, ooh, button's really big. Real, nobody's using real. All right, let's get over here. Let's see if this showed up over here, back to my presentation. And, oh, there they are. See, now it shows up in my slide. And one more question. I promise you this is the last one this hour. And I'm asking what brands come to mind when you're thinking about lecture capture? And we can be talking about like Sony or Panasonic if we're talking about cameras, but certainly there's other brands. There's manufacturers, there's software makers, there's hardware makers. Let's go over to a web page. So what brands come to mind when you think about lecture capture? Camtasia, Echo, Winov, Winov, one of our, one of our sponsors. Hi, Rob. Tamburg, Tamburg. Somebody's actually have, still running Tamburg on their campus. They got bought out by Cisco a while ago. Crestron, uh, Echo 360, Cloud, Echo, Camtasia, really big Camtasia, really big Winov. Podium, I don't know Podium. Uh, Matter, Matterhorn, yes. All right, let's get back to my slides. So, let's, it's a slide. There we go. Um, let's get over here. So, uh, I've categorized capture basically into four realms, where the first of which is software capture. This is software that runs on a computer, uh, on a computing device, and, it can, and that computing device can be a tablet, a phone, an iPad. Uh, but by and large, when we're talking about recording, uh, with software, we're talking about like a Windows or Mac computer, sometimes a Mac Mini hidden under the desk. Uh, if, uh, many of you, are, I suspect, are familiar with uh, uh, Penn State's one button solution. Uh, it is a computer running software. It is an iMac running software. Uh, not an iMac, Mac Mini. Uh, it is affordable, it is highly affordable. Some, uh, some software capture so solutions are free. Uh, some of them are freemium, first 10 minutes are free, uh, others are not. Uh, I have big concerns with software uh, solutions, the uh, chief of which is uh, uh, operating system restrictions. Uh, it means, for instance, if you are running a Mac Mini underneath the podium, that is the computer that is doing the recording. If you come in with your laptop, uh, you have to figure out a way to get your laptop to plug into a Mac Mini. Uh, or, uh, you don't, you, or you don't get to use your laptop. Uh, if you're using an iPad, uh, God help you. Uh, that is, uh, you're not gonna record your iPad. Uh, complex setup and device management, even if I were running a screen recording tool on my laptop here, I'd probably first have to decide which microphone I'm gonna choose. Uh, I might have to decide uh, if I'm gonna record screen A or screen B. This is the kind of setup that professors hate. A professor wants to walk into a classroom and the recorder's gonna start. Uh, you don't want the professor to have to decide which source he's choosing before he starts his recording. That is not a one button solution. Uh, so no multi-device or multi-screen supports. Uh, but these are some makers. Tegrity, which now belongs to uh, McGraw-Hill. Uh, Screencast-O-Matic, I use it all the time. It's a website, you go to it, it, it runs this little applet, and it does these recordings, it's free. Uh, Panopto, uh, Anna mentioned Panopto uh, earlier in her session. I'm surprised not more of you uh, are familiar with it. It's, it's, a, uh, it's very much a David and a Goliath world. They're, uh, they're an upstart, very popular, uh, so uh, something to consider. Uh, this is, that is TechSmith. That is TechSmith's Snagit, is what it's called, and that is their screen recording facet. Uh, and this is Adobe Captivate, a uh, very powerful and costly screen recording tool, 
about $300 in, uh, in, for education pricing. At $300, it's still it's like a 16th the price of the cheapest of the hardware solutions out there. And, and, and that is still like probably one of the uh, most expensive of the software recording tools. Uh, if we look at hardware, we're going to be focusing heavily on hardware in our presentation. Uh, these are dedicated appliances whose job it is to record whatever gets into them. Uh, much more in the one button solution. We have hardware solutions in our classrooms. Uh, Crash on touch panels, you go in and you hit start record and it'll start recording. Professor doesn't need to care about what source he's recording because if it shows up on the screen, it gets recorded. That is what gets recorded. If he wears his mic, we're hearing him. If he forgets to wear his mic, well, these are very large classrooms. The students would probably tell him, hey, I can't hear you. So he's going to put on his mic and we're going to hear him. Uh, ease of use, captures multiple sources, uh, computing device agnostic. Depending on how your teaching station is set up in your classroom, you can probably come in with an Android or an iOS device. And so long as you can get that content on the screen, it's going to get recorded. Uh, cost, spendy. We'll, uh, we'll cover some of that later. Uh, here are some of the brands out there. Uh, this is not to uh, mention many of what are basically generic brands that come out of China, uh, lots of them. Uh, but NCAST, Wolf Vision has a Synap out there that you guys probably want to see. It's very good for like smaller spaces. Uh, Crestron still has a legacy device that we are burdened with, uh, their Capture HD appliance. Uh, Matrox has uh, Matrox Monarch uh, LCS. That's a new one that's on the market. Uh, very disruptive because it's coming in really cheap, really cheap. Uh, and we'll talk about it. Uh, Katura, which is not to be confused with Kaltura. Uh, Xtron has a, a nice line of capture devices at this point. Uh, Winov, new generation of Winovs out there, uh, worth checking out. Uh, Media site, Echo 360, still technically capture companies, technically. That will come up later. Epifan, uh, Epifan like Matrox, these are video encoding companies that are uh, uh, inching their way into capture. Uh, briefly, network capture. Ne network capture is a way of getting content out of a teaching podium, probably through some kind of networking protocol like RTSP, into a server at a different location, and it records on the server. If you don't have a robust network, uh, don't even think about it. We don't think about it. Uh, ease of use, it's, it's got a lot of the same benefits as a hardware solution. Ease of use, reduced hardware costs because you don't have a specific appliance in each classroom. You could probably do RTSP spinning out of almost anything that's installed in your classroom. Uh, it's scalable to a certain degree. Uh, cons, structurally complex network reliability. Uh, you need to know your networks to make this work. Don't, don't bother. And then studio capture, not at all scalable. This is a dedicated recording space. This is a technician or a videographer sitting in the back of the room, like Rob over here. We only have so many Robs. Uh, recording professional, high quality content. You can turn a classroom into a studio space. Uh, it can be costly, uh, more, uh, but it, it serves a double purpose. A professor can teach his class while at the same time he's being recorded. Uh, more likely, you're bringing a professor into a dedicated studio space and he's going to record in that space uh, content which would vary somewhat from what his actual usual lecture would be in front of students. Uh, it's reliable because you have the redundancy. If something goes wrong, that technician is there to first put up his hand and say, hey, something's wrong, hold on. Uh, he can, uh, if one of his tape decks dies, he can pull out another tape deck and, and, and pop it in and run it. Cons cost. You have to pay for that FD. There's that operator. He is there all the time. And it's not all scalable. We don't have enough people to record every class on campus all the time. So going back to hardware, we are going to uh, review a little bit of this report that we wrote. And this report's available online. I can give you all a link. Uh, we looked in our evaluation on these sp six specific uh, manufacturers. We, uh, we reached out to all manufacturers that we could think of, honestly, and we will talk about uh, the ones that are missing from this list at the end. Uh, Katura makes a box called a uh, CaptureCast Pro. It's a very pretty box, uh, but it is, I feel, very studio-centric. It's not very much a like one-button purpose uh, built into a classroom solution. 
this is Crestron's legacy capture HD appliance, uh, one RU rack mounted appliance. It's been around good four or five years. It has not seen much evolution since it was deployed. Epifan, which has for years now been making video encoding uh, devices, is moving into capture. This, uh, picture this as a, a mobile encoding the box that you can take with you when you're doing a, a production on site. It happens to have a hard drive and a record button. So it becomes now a capture device. Um, Actually, Epifan also has a uh, rack-mounted version of this, which is basically the same guts with a different form factor. Um, this is the Extron SMP351, uh, arguably Extron's response to, uh, to Crestron's device, although immediately uh, superior in terms of inputs and functionality. Uh, and it has evolved over the years. There's new functionality that has come out for this box uh, over time. Uh, NCAS, uh, the NCAS Hydra. Um, Hydra because it can do multiple sources, multiple inputs, multiple recordings, multiple files. Uh, and that's really one of our requirements. Media sites uh, included, into this, included in this evaluation. I don't know why. Uh, we will talk about media site briefly. This was some of our test uh, deck. You can see at the top the Epifan. All the way at the top, you can see uh, both an Extron and a Crestron down at the bottom. We were swapping the machines in and out. We did standard testing, uh, repeat testing on all the boxes. So that we received uh, similar results across the board. And we evaluated 27 different criteria, not mutually exclusive criteria. Like, for instance, if something that could do SFTP uploads doesn't mean it needs to do FTP uploads. Uh, but so, Record two or more sources. That is, that is very forward-looking in the world of lecture capture. Most lecture captures right now are doing only one source. And record them simultaneously and separately. Uh, we do not want composited videos. We do not want a locked-in picture-in-picture video. So that was already a very uh, far-reaching demand from a lot of these manufacturers. Uh, when we asked them uh, for this uh, last year, a lot of them could not deliver. Uh, lo and behold, this year, they're all delivering it. They, they listened. Uh, sidecar data file, this is the metadata. You record with a piece of hardware, and, and, and the initial first generation capture boxes would give you a video, a dumb video. There's no metadata associated. We want, the, we want these files to carry date, time, professor's name. If you're running a PowerPoint, I want slide transitions. I want all that text indexed. We are demanding this of our lecture capture manufacturers. It is no longer an option, it is a necessity. Uh, the ability to do streaming, RTSP, if you look at all these uh, AV appliances out there and they say, oh yeah, we do streaming, we do RTSP. Uh, that is not real streaming. That is a protocol that is used to transmit video from one piece of hardware to another piece of hardware. It is not a protocol used to transmit video to watchers online. That is RTMP. And uh, while many of the, uh, these boxes will do RTSP, very few actually do RTMP. Uh, the ability to upload your files through FTP to any uh, predefined destination or SFTP, preferably because of the reliability of SFTP. Uh, record and upload simultaneously. Some boxes, you hit record, the upload stops. Okay. Uh, record and stream simultaneously. Some boxes promise that they will record. Some boxes promise they will stream. Will they do both? No. Uh, record, to, uh, record to user accessible removable media, walk into a room, pop in a thumb drive, record, you're done. Uh, some of them have that, some of them don't. Record to two locations simultaneously, record to the hard drive and the thumb drive at the same time, maybe. Uh, control the cascade priority for recording destinations. If, if I don't have a thumb drive, it records to the hard drive. If I put in a thumb drive, it records on the thumb drive. If I pull out the thumb drive, it goes right back to the hard drive. Some, you have to program that. You pull out the thumb drive and it freaks out. I don't know where to record anymore. Okay. Uh, uh, recover from failed transfers. So again, you start a recording, the upload stops. You expect that when that recording ends, the re upload should resume. Some of them don't. Logging, you'd think this would be intuitive, and alarms as well. Uh, if a recording has failed, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to log into the box and see what happened? When did the recording start? When did the recording stop? Some boxes do not give you logging. They do not tell you anything about what happened. It may have been offline for three weeks and you didn't know it because the box didn't tell you. 
uh, audio meters, so you can tell instantly that when I'm talking into my microphone, something is actually being recorded. Uh, uh, confidence monitor, uh, what is being recorded? Do I see myself? Do I see the, uh, the presentation? This is important now if we're recording multiple sources. It used to be, as I said, you walk into the room, if it shows up on a projector, it's getting recorded. But now I've got a second source. I've got a document camera or I've got a webcam. I'm recording both sources simultaneously. I need to see what is actually being recorded, and that's what the confidence monitor comes in as. External control system uh, compatibility, we're talking about Crestron control, uh, AMP, Xtron control, that kind of thing. Uh, internal scheduling options, the ability to tell the recording device, start recording at nine, stop recording at 10. Um, direct operation, uh, push buttons on the front panel. Most of them have those, some don't. Uh, APIs, the ability to program to the box. Uh, uh, you know, it's got metadata, leverage that metadata however you like. Uh, external control system integration, actually that, I've got two of those, external control system compatibility and integration. Oh, external content system integration. That's Kaltura, that's Panopto. That means you've got this recording with this metadata, you upload this stuff into something like Kaltura and Panopto and it knows what to do with it. More than just it's a video, it's a video with metadata and that metadata now becomes transcripts for your video, chapters for your slides. Some of these actually do this and this is what we demand of them. And remote access to internal storage. We are at this very moment uh, doing a lot of sneakerware uh, support for the, for the Crestron hardware we have on our campus. When these things go down, we actually have to go to the room, check out the box, and recover the, uh, the recordings from the box itself. Uh, anyway, this is the matrix, you can't read that. Uh, but that's yeses and nos all the way down. This is points allocated to each one, and this is where it comes out. MSRP, not preferential education pricing, uh, and their score. The most expensive, as, uh, exponentially the most expensive is also by far the lowest score. Well, except for the question. Um, Sonic Foundry's appliances only, the media site appliances, only upload to media site. Only. There is no FTP function, there is no SFTP function, they do not upload to anything else. You do a recording, it uploads, it uploads to media site. If you do not have a media site service contract with access to media site in the, in the cloud, these devices are entirely useless to you. This whole thing came out of a presentation I saw at Educause about four or five years ago in Anaheim where Sonic Foundry's VP of education or something came out and did a presentation and he talked about modular, uh, modular lecture capture solutions. You're going to be able to use anything to record and upload anywhere. You're going to be able to use a media site recorder and upload to Kaltura. He said that. I didn't. He said that. It was like five years ago, I was like one of three people in the room had ever heard of Kaltura. And he talked about using a media site recorder to upload to Kaltura. Uh, when we started doing this evaluation, they put me on the line with another VP, VP of sales or something, and I told them, like, this is what we want. This is what these boxes need to be able to do. And it's like, yeah, yeah, sure, our boxes do that. They don't. They don't. Uh, NCAS, really nice, 90 points. Uh, good price. Remember, these are MSRP, not educational pricing. Uh, the Extron S&P 351, good price, good, good score. Uh, Epifan, it's... I'd argue it's a much more of a mobile kind of thing. Uh, the Katura box is suffering from, it feels very much like it's a 1.0 version product. Uh, you could say the Epifan is the same as well. And the Crestron is just, I mean, it was first to the market basically in this kind of like agnostic recording solutions and then saw like zero evolution when, since it came to the market. They lock up, they crash. We reboot them nightly to keep them from crashing. Uh, and other fun things. Um, here it is on a grid. Um, that was NCAST, Extron, Epifan near the top, and all the way bottom right, the Sonic Foundry. That's functionality and affordability on the grid. Uh, so, Echo360, not on the list. We did not evaluate them. First, if you go to Echo360's website, I dare you to find their hardware. They are no longer a hardware maker, despite the fact that they still make hardware. They are a video cloud platform. They are a direct competitor to Panopto, a direct competitor to Kaltura. 
The fact that they happen to also build hardware is something that they try to keep to themselves these days. Uh, when I talked to them about it, they were very honest. They said, well, no, if you record with an Echo 360 appliance, it has to upload to Echo 360. And so, okay, well, then I guess you don't qualify for this valuation. Thanks. And WinOff ha happened to have been in the middle of a product transition. Their new generation products are actually on display here today. So you can see their, uh, their C3 and their L3. Uh, their new generation wasn't ready at the time, and we didn't think it fair to evaluate their last generation hardware in this. So WinOff did not happen to be included. Uh, but yeah, we definitely give them a look now. They, they seem like very robust boxes that, in fact, check off a lot of those uh, requirements on our list. And uh, what's new? Extron. In addition to Extron's uh, SMP351, there's a 352, which is a two-source input unit, uh, much more expensive, probably the double the price of the 351. And then uh, I'd argue disruptive in the market, uh, uh, just like uh, Matrox boxes. Uh, disruptive in the market is Extron's SMP111, uh, probably with an MSRP of about 1,500 bucks. Uh, they're tiny, and they do single source recording, but you can do, I believe you can do streaming out of them. Uh, and, they, and they do some metadata recording. Uh, what we need out of these boxes is adoption of standards like, we, uh, like the open capture video standard. This is something that uh, Kaltura uh, initiated and then handed off to uh, IMS Global, which, uh, which is a standards consortium. If you guys have a learning management system, uh, you might be familiar with IMS Global as the company that administers the LTI standard. Um, and what we're seeing is boxes like the WinOff box, the Extron box, the Matrox box, and even software solutions like McGraw-Hill's Tegrity all support Open Capture Standard. Open Capture Standard is basically an XML standard that says I have recorded one or more video sources, I have generated a metadata file, I have looked at the source recording, and it is a PowerPoint, I have added bookmarks to all the slides, I have read all the text on those PowerPoints, and turned it into searchable text. And, uh, and we are seeing adoption of this from companies uh, across the board. Um, Certainly uh, the most enthusiastic on the video platform side is Kaltura because it was their standard initially. Uh, but the fact that we are seeing adoption of the standard from the hardware manufacturers means that it is uh, certainly, uh, it is a reasonable expectation that we should see this from other hardware manufacturers. So if we go back to the list that we had earlier, Uh, we expect that each of these companies should adopt uh, the Open Capture standard as a standard for recording. And, and, the, and then there's a scheduling component as well. You see it with uh, Winov, you see it with Extron. Uh, they, uh, most of these boxes support to some degree some kind of iCal uh, calendaring, which uh, basically triggers starts and stops on recordings. And Kaltura has uh, adopted that. This is Kaltura on the other end adopting standards from, uh, from the manufacturers where you can schedule, you can go into your Kaltura interface and say, I, I, as a professor, would like to start a recording at nine and stop a recording at 10 in this room. And basically you can walk into the room, never press a button, that recording will start and stop. And when you get back to your desk, because you were logged into your Kaltura interface with your account, uh, that recording appears in your collection of uh, videos uh, in the time it takes for that file to upload. And we see that, we see that now. You can almost certainly do it immediately with Extron and, uh, Extron and Matrox and Winoff equipment. It's a simple matter of uh, setting it up with your uh, Kaltura uh, service agreement if you're using Kaltura. I expect that we will be seeing the same adoption from Panopto and Ensemble and others in the near future. So that is a how brief was that? Well, we've got about 20 minutes left. That was a, a brief overview of what is a 20-page report on uh, these lecture capture appliances. And I'll tell you, this report already is a year old and starting to get very long in the tooth. But our requirements, I feel, were very forward-looking. We needed, we needed from these companies 
uh, features uh, that, are, that I feel um, is going, are, are going to future-proof us. If we were to buy boxes today at $3,500, $4,000 that didn't carry the functionality that we are demanding, we'd simply be right back in the market a year from now. So at this point, if anybody has any questions, what are, you, what are you all using? I've heard uh, you guys were talking about TechSmith, Echo 360, and what, what are, let's not talk about the bad parts. What are the good parts? Scheduling recordings, metadata. What are the good things about Echo 360, Doug? Well, Echo 360 for us, this is, you're trying to, this, this Oh, hold on, Doug, there's gonna be a micro microphone coming to you. So, it's ironic that we're having this conference in Echo 360 is being discussed because right now we are at a, a, you know, I told you over the last two years we'll be hitting the crossroads. We're at the crossroads today. Uh, that is because Echo 360 is changing how they, how they function and essentially it's become a cloud-based lecture capture system. Mm -hmm. Meaning that in the past, over since 2009, we've had our server where our content lives, managed by one of our OIT uh, system administrators, very much doing it in-house with the tools and the products we purchased from Echo and their tech support too. But now we go to the cloud, and we're doing our trial right now for the very first time, and it's actually, this is week two, and yesterday during one of the sessions, one of my staff who was managing our first live use of Echo in the cloud said, Doug, please pull out your iPad and let, show it, watch it, tell me it's working, uh -huh. and I was able to successfully do that for him. Um, it is changing our thought process right now on you know, our ability to stay with them. Echo's always been a challenge, I, I should say, not Echo, lecture capture in general on my campus because I have a model where I actually charge academic units to use the, the services. Uh, I've never been a fan of that. I've never liked that. And uh, I can tell you, based on the declining use of our lecture capture, the university academic departments don't like that either. But you uh, have to charge because there's a recurring annual cost. Exactly. Yeah. There's a, and, and there will be a annual cost now for uh, starting of just, it's just one or two thousand dollars more starting in the cloud for the next year annual contract. Uh, I actually don't have to buy new appliances. I can use my safe capture appliances, but they're all get directed to the cloud. Right. In our trial classroom, that one's going to the cloud right now. Uh, we can't pull that back and have it come to our server. We have to designate where it's going to live. Uh, their tech support has been good. I know that those people those who have made universities and colleges throughout the United States and the world who have made major investments in Echo are still per proceeding with them. We never so fully bought into we can't back mm -hmm. away and change. At the same time we're working on this, I have one of my staff who's designing a proof of concept uh, Extron lecture capture room with we're getting all the technology uh, and then making sure we have the best cameras we can we can purchase which you know the the Panasonic rep out here was at my campus a few weeks ago showing us what he he has available because we love Panasonic products and want to stay with those uh, but it's it's a game changer for us and the other thing is I wanted to say this because in the past year since we've talked about lecture capture uh, my, my CIO, associate CIO, did a e-car survey through Educause uh, of 500 students. And the questions were, what are the things we are not doing that we should do? Mm -hmm. And the number one item without question that came out was lecture capture. And we do it, but we do it for a small sliver, a sliver of the academic unit that has money to pay for it. So that's, that's now my CIOs see that and realize, okay, this is something we need to address. We need to finally help Doug and his unit with, with resources, i.e. money, and not be so dependent on the chargeback model. Every, every year we've lost a whole bunch of clients who views, we are like, they're here forever. No, they're not. People retire, programs end, Programs go totally online and go to your LMS, and that's what's happened to us. So, the um, uh, the chief driver, I'd argue, for our campus for lecture capture is students. Uh, students who tell their professors, uh, "Hey, I was in a class last term that was recorded. Can you record this one as well?" Uh, most of the responses we get from faculty are, "I didn't know I could record this class," and let's be fair, that is 
generally a faculty's response to most technology available. Uh, it's not relevant to them until someone tells them to use it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it drives our lecture capture usage. Uh, and we see growth term over term, year over year. Um, faculty uh, use lecture capture more uh, all the time. And that increases the need for a reliable system. We don't want 10% or 15% of our recordings to fail all the time. Uh, when, it's, when that 10 or 15% is like one recording a term, that's not so bad. When it's like 15 recordings a week, that becomes a problem. Um, I know at the University of Manchester, and I think I'll mention them some more later in the uh, uh, video platform discussion, the uh, University of Manchester went through an entire process, and I talked to them about it, uh, where they, in essence, enabled recording of all classes on their campus. It was not an opt-in, it was an opt-out. We are going to record your class. That was their, that was their approach. Uh, and it was a heck of a thing. Uh, they went, uh, they had to go through their faculty senate. They, there was a lot of uh, pushback from faculty. And ultimately, uh, I think like two years into it, uh, everyone's wondering, what was the big deal? They're recording all their classes. If someone wants to opt out, they can opt out. Uh, but ultimately, uh, those recordings get, rec uh, those classes get recorded. They use uh, basically uh, uh, in-house built boxes, uh, similar to like Raspberry Pis. Uh, they up, uh, they schedule through in-house coded software. They upload into uh, OpenCast Matterhorn. Uh, so it's, they're like. They built it all themselves. So it's not really a feasible solution that extends to other universities. But they said, there was this need. Our students are demanding that we record all our classes. And so they started recording all the classes. And the recordings end up in the professor's folder or collection or whatever you want to call, call it. And if the professor doesn't want to share that video, he doesn't have to. Uh, but uh, going into it in this proactive sense uh, eliminated a lot of the confusion, a lot of the uh, hurdles to faculty involvement. No one needs to go to a scheduling tool and schedule their recordings. No one needs to even press a button. The classes are recorded. And, and that's a very, I'd argue, innovative approach. Uh, I don't think any of us could show up on campus tomorrow and tell our faculty that we're going to start recording all their classes, even if we even had hardware in all our classes to do that. Uh, it, would be a, it would be a process. But uh, there's, there's certainly a benefit to that one. Uh, and I like that they went, uh, went about doing that. And uh, they have put that up as a model for the world. And I think we all need to look at them to see if maybe we can do that too. Anything else? In the back. Yes, if I remember where it is, I'll just go to my blog. Not a bit.ly, really, is it? Uh, hold on, let me do this instead. I promise this will be short. I don't know if that helps. I probably should have done a bit.ly. So yeah, you can see we published it in 06 of 2016, so last June, and already kind of out of date. Uh, but yeah, the market's evolving. We're seeing a lot of new players. What's happening uh, is uh, convergence between companies that used to make lecture capture hardware are moving more into the production realm. And you see that with uh, Winoff's got rack-mounted lecture capture appliances, but they also have production units. And on the other hand, you have these people who make these uh, video encoders and, uh, and studio units like Epifan and Matrox who are moving more into the capture realm. So what was basically you know, 10 companies here and 10 companies here is suddenly 20 companies everywhere doing everything. It's just simply, simply different lines of products. I'll let you go. Thank you, guys.